Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Thank you all for coming back, and uh, thank Don for that prayer. Tonight, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Christian growth, how we grow as Christians, uh, what that should look like, what categories maybe uh, that we should be considering, uh, uh, sort of weighing our growth and particularly how that impacts our evangelism, the way that we're able to spread the gospel, talk to other people about it. And the idea being that as we grow, we should then get to a point where we're ready to go, right? So one of the things that Jesus said in the Great Commission, Great Commission is to go <clears throat> and baptize all nations, teaching them in the name of the Father, Son. And our command is to go. Right, we, that's, that's one of the things that we are supposed to do. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, we have to be ready to go. So we have to prepare ourselves to go and to, to preach the gospel and go in any way that, that uh, we may uh, deem fit. And to do that, we need to grow a little bit, okay? So I wanna look at three different areas in our, in our Christian lives that we, are sh that we should be growing in order to go, in order to have as a goal the evangelism of anyone in our lives, and that would be knowledge and maturity and faith. So growth in each one of these aspects. So I'm going to hit on each one of these tonight, <clears throat> look at how they're important in our lives as Christians and, and just commands from Scripture about how we're supposed to grow in each every, every one of these things. So the first one being knowledge, um, we should recognize that God wants us to be knowledgeable about him. That's one of the things that he commanded the Israelites from the very start uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 6. We all know that very well, to teach them diligently his word, to have it uh, above your doorpost, to be discussing it day and night. Uh, today, if we were to say that, we would be talking about speaking and, and discussing his word at the dinner table. Uh, as we as we wake up and eat breakfast together, <clears throat> as we uh, travel with each other to various destinations, whether it be vacation or visiting family members, whatever it might be, uh, teaching the word diligently in this sense, the way he commanded for the Israelites means make it part of your daily conversation. Make it part of your, the, your, the talks that you have daily with your kids and with your family members. He foretold... Uh, in the Old Covenant about a, a depth of knowledge that we would have in the New Covenant uh, in Jeremiah 31, and he said that my law will be within them and upon their heart. So the law would go from something that was written down in dozens and dozens and dozens of rules to something that was on our hearts through his spirit. Okay, and that was foretold in Jeremiah 31. So that knowledge would be so deep within us that it would be as with our spirit. So God's spirit working within us, uh, convicting us and bringing us to a greater knowledge of him. And our hearts should yearn for the knowledge of God. Uh, Proverbs chapter 2, starting in verse 3, says, Yes, if you cry out for knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Wisdom and knowledge are very often referred to in the Proverbs and the Psalms in a feminine way. And that is because they are precious things. They are things that are a gift to us in many ways, but they're things that we should be seeking uh, because of their value. Knowledge and wisdom. Uh, not a value that you can trade with other people not a value that you can put a, a price tag on, but a value that adds to your life in meaningful ways, having the knowledge and the wisdom of God. We should recognize that our knowledge should be ever increasing. Uh, we begin by desiring the milk of the word. In 1 Peter 2, verse 2, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word so that, it may, <clears throat> so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. The pure milk of the word is that very simplest of, of things to know about God. Okay, why? <clears throat> it's the reason why babies sleep so much is because they're, they're just absorbing everything around them and they're learning so much each and every day. Uh, we should be the same way, not in terms of sleeping that much, of course, but, but absorbing everything that we can 
about God. Absorbing all that information is how we should be. The Hebrew writer encourages us to increase our knowledge and teaching and go on to perfection. In chapter 6, verse 1, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity. So, uh, talking about a growth there in our knowledge. The elementary teachings would be the basic knowledge about Jesus. And so, grow from that, leave that, move on from the milk of the word, and move on to the meat of the word. So there are levels in knowledge of the doctrine of Christ, and there are the basics, things that uh, lead us on, and then there are the things that lead us on to that perfection, onto that maturity, as he says here in Hebrews 6. That knowledge is going to aid us in evangelism, and it's very easy to see that connection. For starters, we're not going to be surprised. We're not going to be caught off guard when people quote scripture or say that Jesus did that or didn't do that or the Bible says this or doesn't say that. We're going to know the context behind difficult passages that people might cite and try to catch us on, uh, you know, a gotcha moment or something like that. We're going to know, you know, that doesn't quite sound right. I, I recognize that from things that I've learned in the past. I remember that story. I remember that phrase, whatever it might be. And it's going to trigger those things in our mind because we've studied it, because we know it, because we've sought that knowledge out. We're all charged with the ability to make a defense for the hope that lies within us. As, as Peter says, 1 Peter 3, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Okay, There's an important key to this, though. The no this knowledge is not as, as a math equation. Okay, so a, a math equation about salvation might be something like Jesus plus the cross equals salvation. Okay, just a very simple thing. It, it's, it's not just basic knowledge like that. Rather, it's an intimate and a thorough knowledge. All right, in 2 Peter 1, verse 5, it says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge. And he goes on there, we're familiar with how... how we're supposed to be adding things to our faith. But the knowledge that he is talking about here is not the very basic kind of knowledge that we find in Scripture, which would be uh, gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. That's the Greek term for this kind of basic kind of knowledge. Uh, this is the, the term epinosis, or in other words, to become thoroughly acquainted with or to know very well. And it's almost more of a description of how you would know someone in a relationship how you know them as a person. You know their characteristics, you know their traits, you know what they may or may not do or may or may not say, or you know what they think about things. You have a thorough knowledge of them. It's more than just a one plus one equals two. All right. <clears throat> so this is about having a deeper knowledge than that basic kind of level. That's what we're supposed to strive to. And that's what we're supposed to grow into eventually as Christians. So we should always be on that track, growing in that knowledge until we get somewhere to that epinosis kind of a point, right, where we've become thoroughly acquainted with the knowledge of God. The second thing we should grow in is our maturity, <clears throat> like we talked about at the, at the beginning. And a Christian uh, growth and maturity uh, is often best reflected in, in an attitude, okay, in, in a demeanor, in an approach to things, um, a change in your heart, you might say. And, th and those are going to be, uh, things like being um, virtuous or self-governing or steadfast or patient. A lot of things you're going to find in Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Okay, and the patient part here is, is I think, the most interesting. That's, I think, the best idea we get about what is meant by maturity. Uh, if we look into Thayer's lexicon, which is a good reference tool uh, when you're studying the Bible... Uh, about that word patient there in 2 Peter 1. He says, This is the characteristic of a man who is unswerved in his deliberate purpose and his, loyal, his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. Okay, that's a patient person or a mature person. They've grown in their maturity as a Christian to the point that even the greatest trials and sufferings aren't going to swerve them. All right? So they've grown to the level of maturity where they're not going to be swayed by everything that happens around them. It's not going to bother them because they're mature. They can handle it. They've grown to that degree. In Hebrews 13, go ahead and turn over there with me. 
I'm not going to put all of them up here on the board. I'll make you guys work a little bit. <clears throat> so Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. It says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? The word content here also reflects a degree of maturity that we have. And this is about finding peace or satisfaction in every stage of life. No matter what stage you're in, you're able to make the most of it. You're able to find peace no matter what. That doesn't mean you can't better yourself or your situation. It doesn't mean you shouldn't strive to improve things. But it doesn't crush you either. Uh, let's also look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10. Turn over there with me as well. This idea of being content hits on uh, this passage which is one of the most used and abused passages in, in our culture today, in our popular culture anyways. Philippians 4, verse 10 through 12, it says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Now look at the next verse. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, if you're like me, you've probably seen that verse 13 in a lot of sporting contests, right? It's, it's like the main motivation for people to hit a home run or to make that sack on the quarterback or something is because they can do all things through Christ who strengthens so they can achieve some great sporting event. And that's not at all what this is talking about. This is directly addressing the idea of being content in whatever circumstance you're in because you have the strength of the Lord within you to make it through those things because he has given you maturity leading to that contentedness. Okay, it's not about being able to accomplish some great goal in life. It's not about getting that raise at work or, or hitting that home run, whatever it might be. Doing all things through him who strengthens me is about being able to do what he said in the prior verses. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I'm in. I know how to get along with humble means or in prosperity. In every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry of both having abundance and suffering need. What is that secret? Having him who strengthens me. Because he can do all things if he has Christ. Christ gives him strength. So whether he has little or a lot, he's fine. He's content. He's learned to be content in whatever circumstance he is in. So this passage is about pointing back to Jesus as the source of strength within you to live with little means or a lot. Not about pointing to Jesus to give you that extra torque on your swing to hit that ball out of the park, okay? This is about a degree of maturity that you reach in recognizing that you draw your strength from Jesus, not from the wealth or the abilities that you have around you or anything in and of yourself. It's, it's of Jesus. It's pointing to him. Another measure of growing in our maturity is that we're not argumentative or quarrelsome. Uh, Paul stressed this quite a bit uh, to both Timothy and Titus. Uh, we're going to go through a few of those passages here. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 14, it says, Charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit. Verse 16, Shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase more ungodliness. Verse 23, Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. So growing in maturity is understanding when you've reached that point where you're striving about words to no profit, when you are being foolish and ignorant in your disputes, okay? So when it comes to matters of doctrine for what we believe as, as a church, those aren't foolish or ignorant disputes. But when it comes to matters of arguing about words here and there, uh, saying this, or this thing or that thing, uh, this word, you know, means this, it doesn't mean that, that there's, there reaches a point 
to where we get to where that's nothing but quarrelsome and it, and it just drives wedges between us. He says the similar thing to Titus, chapter 3, verse 9. Avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. This is coming from a former Jew. Okay? Avoid genealogies and strivings about the law. He says those things don't profit us at all. They're useless for us because those things have no bearing on our salvation now. They have no bearing on what we teach about Jesus right now. Strivings about the law don't matter. So that's a way in which we grow in our maturities when we recognize when an argument uh, with a brother has reached that stage. Another aspect of our growth and maturity is being gentle or meek. Jesus said, blessed are the meek in Matthew 5. He said that his yoke was gentle and easy in Matthew 11. Paul encouraged the Philippian, uh, Philippians to let their gentleness be known to all mankind in, in chapter 4. And Paul asserted that he was gentle among the Thessalonians rather than asserting his authority rashly on them in 1 Thessalonians 2. And then finally, James says that one of the qualities of wisdom from above is gentleness in James chapter 3 and verse 17. Having a gentle and meek spirit is a sign of maturity. And that's not to say that you don't speak up for what is truth or what is right. It doesn't mean that you're a pushover. It means that you, you aren't combative, you aren't argumentative, you aren't ready to throw a punch the first sign of disagreement. It means you are meek. Meek is power under control, right? It's not the lack of power. It's not the absence of power. It's power under control. And gentleness is the way you control that power. So being gentle and meek is a sign of Christian maturity. Okay. So how does this work in our evangelism? More often than not, our actions are viewed from afar uh, by other people, and they do more to evangelize than anything we might be able to say to other people in a one-on-one -on -one situation. So possessing the qualities of Christian maturity help us to ensure that we're walking in a manner worthy of Christ. Whether we are in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation or argument with somebody, or someone is observing us in that one-on-one -on -one discussion. Growing in maturity is different than growing in knowledge. <clears throat> we must allow God's Word to be implanted in us through the teaching and study of it, in James 1, verse 21. So imagine that we're an old, dried-up sponge, and God's Word is like water. We need to let, us, let that soak into us and fill every vacant spot and let it transform us and let that Christian maturity grow in us. So being the dried up sponge and receiving the water is like receiving that knowledge. The maturity part is letting that mold us, letting that form us into something that looks more like Jesus, someone that responds more like Jesus, uh, someone who is um, thinking of others the way, the way Jesus would. That is where that knowledge that we have can result in more maturity. Okay, and that results in better evangelism, being able to talk to people in a more calm manner, in a more convincing manner uh, about Jesus. Uh, and after all, in, in 1 Peter 3.15 that we, that we already covered, where it says you must be ready to always give a defense for the hope that lies within you, the very next part of that is with gentleness and kindness. Okay, that's, that's the, where the maturity comes in. Being ready to give a defense is the knowledge how you give that defense is the maturity. Finally, growth in our faith. So what is meant by faith? It can sometimes be a word that just gets thrown around uh, a lot uh, without any real clear definition or understanding. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. One thing we should take from that is that faith is not a leap. Faith isn't a leap. Faith is based on substance and evidence. All right? Substance of our hope is God's promises, what God has promised. So we have faith in what God has promised. Why do we have faith on that? Well, the evidence of things that we haven't seen before. The evidence for that is, is how God has dealt with his children in the past, how God has kept his promises in the past. All right? It's something you can point to. The writer goes on in Hebrews 11 to give evidences for our faith 
by citing Abraham and Noah and Sarah, these, these heroes of the faith, we call them a lot of times, talking about what God promised them and then what he did for them, how he delivered them. And that's the evidence of things that we haven't seen before, but we know about those stories. And those, those people uh, witnessed those things. Uh, Abraham, Noah, Sarah, all those people performed what they did or, or, or were told by God to do what they did. And then people wrote those things down, and those things were passed through, on through history, and we have them today. We, did, we didn't see them, but we have them as an evidence for us today. And we have to start with that faith. Okay, Hebrews eleven six. 6, Without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is God. So we have to start with that faith. Without it we can't please him, and we must then allow room for faith to develop within us. In Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That has to develop in us by the sinking in of the word of God, that, that, that water onto the sponge, turning us into that malleable thing, right? Something that God can work with, something that God can form. So the testimony of miracles performed, the testimony of the resurrection uh, no rebuttal of these things in any record around their occurrence. That is the substance of the things that we have not seen. That's the whole reason for the writing of John's gospel, by the way. In John chapter 20 and verse 30 and 31, he says, I have written these things so that you may have faith. And he has done so many more things that if, we, if they were all written down, they would fill the world with books. Okay? But these are written, he says, so that you may believe. So those things that were written down were provided to us as the substance and the evidence of things that we have not seen. So those are the things that inform our faith, and those are the things that we use to grow in our faith. So this lesson has all been about growing and going, right? Growing in knowledge and maturity and faith and getting to a point where your growth in those things has prepared you to be able to go. Well, what if, we, what if we flip that? What if we said, go and grow? All right. Sometimes our growth in knowledge and maturity and faith are a little bit dependent on us going first. All right. It's a little bit like just getting, getting thrown into the frying pan and, and seeing what you make. Okay. There's a perfect example of this in Scripture. Peter... <clears throat> came to the understanding of the acceptance of Gentiles into Christ by going. Recall the story in Acts chapter 10 and chapter 11. Peter is at uh, Simon's house, and he is on the roof, and he has a vision of a blanket being brought down for him with all kinds of unclean animals, right? And, and the Lord says, eat, get up and eat. And he says, no, I've never partaken of anything unclean in my life. And what's God say to him? What, what God has cleansed, do not, do not refuse. Okay? He says that to him three times total. What happens next? Someone comes to Peter and says, Hey, there's this guy Cornelius that wants to talk to you. We were sent here to get you and take you to him. He's a Gentile. Peter still goes. And while Peter is there, he hears what Cornelius tells him, that, he, that Cornelius sent for Peter to come and preach the gospel to him. While he's preaching the gospel to him, the Holy Spirit descends upon that room and everyone there is speaking tongues just like Peter and the apostles did on the day of Pentecost. Same way. If Peter had not gone, he would not be able to grow in that knowledge that Gentiles are now accepted by the Lord. This was years after Jesus was crucified. But he's only just then coming to that understanding. That's, that's a very interesting thing when you think about it. How long it took the early church uh, to understand that Jesus' sacrifice is applied to all. And it opened the door, so to speak, for all to come to God, Gen Jew and Gentile alike. But it took that miraculous event and for Peter to go to the house of Cornelius, for him to grow in his understanding about what God accepts <clears throat> forget about evangelism 
to other people who, who don't know Jesus? What if we just, what if we just went, or what if we just go uh, to our assembly? What if we just go to the times of worship when we have set up here? It's easy to grow in faith and knowledge, especially when you're encouraged at the gathering of the saints. Okay, so sometimes growing in your faith and knowledge is not just about you sitting and studying the Bible at home. It's not just about you uh, praying on your own. A lot of times growing in those things is about you engaging in conversations and studies with other Christians. And you can't do that unless you are going to where other Christians gather. Okay, you can't do that unless you are going to gather with the church. And so that's an important point to make as well. So, so growing in these aspects helps our evangelism, but going, evangelizing, can also help us to grow as well. And not just going to evangelize, but going to worship, going to study. Okay? So this lesson is for encouragement of the church. Uh, but if you're here tonight and you haven't turned your life over to Jesus, just consider that unless you're studying God's word, and trying to find Jesus, any knowledge that you're growing in is man's knowledge. And it is as shifting as the wind is changing, right? There are many things that you can study and become an expert in in this life. Why not try the Word of God? Why not try the thing that will bring you life in the next life? <clears throat> you may consider yourself a mature person, right? You're very studious. You're very mature. But... Is that a maturity that is based on what our society and our culture accepts and what people have deemed appropriate or um, politically acceptable? Uh, or is it a maturity that is acceptable by God because it's based on his knowledge and, and faith in him? There may be people or things that you put your trust in, but it's nothing compared to the faith that's found in our Lord Jesus. So you can have faith in plenty of things. You can have faith that your alarm clock's going to go off tomorrow because it always has. You can have faith that the sun's going to come up tomorrow because it always has. Well, you can have faith in God that he's going to keep his promises to you because he always has as well. So our call to you this evening, if you haven't accepted Christ, is to turn to Jesus, confess him as Lord of Lords, and take your old life down into that watery grave of baptism and come up as a new person cleansed of those sins through the blood of Christ. And we would call on you to do that as we together stand and sing.